No weapon formed against you will prosper, right? Amen. Amen. No COVID or anything like that's going to come your way. Why? Because the blood of Jesus got you covered. Amen. Amen. Um, all right. So we've been having fun worshiping and singing a couple of songs before service. And I thought we'd do that so we can probably start right on time. But one of the things, what did we have? We learned about singing that's basic, basic truths about singing that so others, you can pass it on to others so they can sing and actually receive benefits. What did we learn? Prepares you for the word. How so? Because his presence does what? Softens you and gets you ready. Because God inhabits the praises of his people. What else does it do? What's the practical application of singing? What does it do? You breathe in and exhale God when your mind is focused on him. So you can make mention of the name of Jesus. But when you purpose to speak the name of Jesus as a tool or weapon, okay, you bring it out of your spirit. You see what I'm saying? You focus on it. Well, when you focus to really worship them, are you just singing la, 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 or actually are we focusing to tell them, God, you're a mighty God, you know. God, you're awesome. And so in that exchange, we get caught up. And there's nothing stopping God from getting us in such a condition as we sing and ministering to him that we can see clouds, visions, we can receive healing. The idea is when we can let him know. I know this is going to be easy for me to say, not as easy to do. When, when we get so, him so focused, we're so focused on him that everything around us disappears. Listen, when we're so focused on him, when everything around us disappears, you'll receive whatever you need at the time. The key is how, and when we start focusing, how quick distractions happen. Can I share a quick testimony and then we'll sing? I remember before I was saved, I was a real, you know, partier and all that kind of stuff. We went over some friends of mine from high school's house. And he had his brother from prison in. Now, unbeknownst to me, his brother from prison had gotten saved in the chaplaincy there. And everybody else was stoned to the max, and I was pretty stoned, and I was sitting in the back. That's one of those expressions, if this is not edited out, that you, you're, you're intoxicated, you're stoned, okay? But he began to tell me about his experience with God. And I'm going to relate it to it, distractions. Now, I wasn't saved about this, but I was interested because he made sharing about God interesting. Because God is interesting. Why do people go, oh, let me tell you about our God. Or I want to tell you about our church, and then they give five or six disclaimers. Oh, it's not very big, but the people are loving. Don't ever share about God that way. Just stop. Just say, come to church with me. You know what I mean? We think we're helping out God when actually we're looking foolish. Okay, well, anyway, this guy kept sharing. And the more he kept sharing... The more I kept feeling this funny thing in the room it was God's presence. But then all of a sudden, it was the wind picked up, and the trees started bashing against the house. I mean, the trailer house. So you could hear it. The walls are thin. No, boosh, 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 boosh. And he would talk about Jesus, and I get really interested. And then the distractions. Would, I mean, it was like war out there. I mean, there was no wind when we first came in. There was no nothing. It was just like if the enemy was scratching on the thing, trying to get me to not listen. And the guy affected me so much that it, it, it well, the Spirit of God did. I didn't know what it was. So, of course, the next day, he spent the night there, but the next day, sobered up a little bit, went home. I told my dad, I said, Dad, this guy shared a bunch of stuff with me. And I, of course, I didn't want to tell him it was all about Jesus. And you wouldn't believe it. I could feel some different, I didn't know presence, 
feeling different things and the distractions. And it was almost as like the devil was trying to get me not to hear. And I'm not even saved. And I'm telling my dad this. Can you see the sense of humor of God in all this? But that's what the enemy does. The more we can stay focused on God and listen, make ourselves listen. And when we're singing, make ourselves concentrate. The more caught up in the presence we get. And yet we haven't left anywhere. We've only done one thing. We focused our soul in on the Lord. And the Lord says, yoke up with me, learn from me. I'm mild and meek, right? And you will find what to your souls? Yeah, so when we sing, we find rest to our souls. When we focus on God, we find rest to our souls. How many know a good time of refreshing after being chased out towards Jews is a good thing, right? Amen. So, Father, we just thank you for this time we want to spend in your presence. Father, not only do we feel welcome in your presence, Father, in this day and as we stand up and sing up and worship you, but, Lord, we want you to feel welcome in our praises and worship. That there be an exchange. Oh, yeah, right there, there's the anointing. Exchange in the anointing so that we're refreshed, renewed. And those on the way, Lord, get them here safely. In Jesus' name, and we all said, Amen. are you ready? Everyone go, ah. Okay? Those of you who are really good, go, ah, ah. Good, you're really good, all right? Ah, Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power. Ah, Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thine outstretched arm. Next verse. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Great mighty God. Great in counsel and mighty indeed. Everyone, mighty indeed. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Everybody top. Ah, Lord God, <coughs> which made the heavens and the earth by thy great power. Ah, Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thine outstretched arm. And nothing is too difficult for thee. Well, nothing is too difficult for thee. Why, you're a great mighty God, great in counsel and mighty indeed, mighty indeed. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Nothing, 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 nothing. Absolutely nothing, nothing is too difficult for thee. One more time, and nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing, nothing is too difficult for thee. Next one is, arise and sing, you children of Zion, for the Lord has set you free. Woo! Arise and sing, you children of Zion, for the Lord hath delivered thee. Let's do it again. Arise and sing, you children of Zion, for the Lord has set you free. Be free. Woo! Arise and sing, you children of Zion, for the Lord hath delivered thee. Open, 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 open up your hearts, you children of Zion. Open up your hearts. You children of Zion, open up your hearts, you children of Zion, for the Lord hath delivered thee. Arise and sing, arise and sing, you children of Zion, for the Lord has set you free. Woo! Arise and sing, you children of Zion, for the Lord hath delivered thee. Da da da, open up your hearts. You children of Zion, open up your hearts, you children of Zion. Open up your hearts, you children of Zion, for the Lord hath delivered thee. Open up your hearts, open up your hearts, you children of Zion. Open up your hearts, you children of Zion. Open up your hearts, you children of Zion, for the Lord hath delivered thee. For the Lord has delivered me, Lord has delivered me. For the Lord hath delivered me, heard me. You could just say me, 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 me in the church, right? Amen. 
So he's the Savior of my soul, who is my Jesus, my Jesus. You're the Savior. You're the Savior of my soul. Oh, Jesus, you sure are. You're the Savior of my soul. What's his name? Jesus. His name is Jesus. 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 <laughs> Pull up the underwear. He's a savior of my soul. Look at somebody and say, he's a savior of my soul. You see, we're testifying. Can you sense the presence getting stronger? Let's do it again. So he's a savior of my soul. Speak it out of your spirit. Is Jesus Jesus, and he's a savior of my soul. Everybody on the rooftop, he's a savior of my soul. And demons will flee at the name Jesus. Sweet Jesus, and Jesus, my Jesus, you're the Savior of my soul. the Savior of my soul. Just let it just flow out. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're the Savior. The Savior. You're the Savior of my soul. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. He and the Savior, and the my Lord, and the my Savior, oh, in one accord, and the my Savior, lift up his name, and the my Savior, you'll never be, never be the same. Woo! Glory to God, that's what I spoke in tongues, came right out of there little new song or something. All right, let's get in the Word together. Uh, now, you don't, you don't have to move as fast as I'm moving. You, you're just, it's great, isn't it? In that presence, I would love the presence of God. I mean, church without the presence of God, that'd be a bummer. <laughs> Amen. And not only that, but not only having the presence of God and God in our midst, but in our heart, but loving His Word. Falling in love with his word is very, very important. What's God say? He said in Isaiah 66, he searches to and fro for those who have a contrite spirit and those that tremble at his word. Isaiah 66, I think it's the first three verses. I'm not sure. But he says, heaven's my, my throne and the earth of my footstool. What house will you build me? And then he says, I'll show you to whom I am looking. I'm looking to the one who has a heart who needs God, broken heart, and one who trembles or respects God's word. And that's you. Say amen. All right, we've been doing, and welcome those who are coming in 
to the garage. We sure appreciate those of you that are coming in. More and more are coming in all the time. Some people are peeking in from other states, and we sure appreciate that. This is our Bible study midweek on a Wednesday, and we've been doing a how-to series. So in this how-to series, we've learned, you know, about renewing the mind. We learned about walking in the Spirit. We learned about our place in Christ. But tonight, we're going to learn about how to know God's voice. Not to hear, just hear God's voice, but to know God's voice. So take your Bible, I mean, not your Bible, but your notes and your Bible, and we're going to read right through that first paragraph, I promise not to sway. We got a lot to cover tonight, so that means I'm not going to unload private stories and have you lose place, hopefully not. So today in this lesson, I want to encourage you to grasp the principles and recognize who you are in Christ. Someone say amen. amen. Growing and building trust in the equipment that God has given us is such a thrill once you begin to see God work through you. Can you say amen? And knowing God loves us and wants us to be personal or wants to be personal with us, it's very encouraging, all right? This is so cool. Now, let's hunger to know God's voice, right? We know God speaks through his word. We know that God speaks through the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. We know that God can speak through brothers and sisters. He can speak through preachers and ministers. Can you say amen? But God also speaks in a still, small voice to the believer. And so we're going to find out how to know God's voice. And let me just throw this out before we finish this paragraph. Okay, let's see what the word says about the subject matter and how to develop a listening ear. Hey, can you remember what, what did Jesus say a lot to the disciples? What did he say? Those with ears, let them hear. And I kept on saying, well, why is Jesus saying it? Because the enemy works in such a way that we can hear a sound, but we don't distinguish the notes or the meaning thereof. And that's why we found out that in Jesus' ministry in Matthew 13 that the, the religious people of the day rejected Jesus and thought that their eyes idea of what the Messiah should look like and should do was not what, what Jesus was doing. And so Jesus knew they, they had rejected him. And so from that time on, it says he left the house and, and went to the sea. Now, when you see the word house, and it doesn't have a name of the house, Joseph's house, Mary's house, then you know it's the house of Israel. And when you see the word sea, everyone say sea. And if it doesn't say red sea or dead sea, black sea, then it's talking about a huge group of people, a sea of people. So when Jesus left the house and went to the sea, what does it tell you? The house of Israel rejected him, so he left Israel, and he went to preach to the message to the Gentiles or whosoever would listen. Those with ears, let them hear. So he began to preach in parables, tell stories. You know something what's neat about a story? Marvin knows this. That if somebody's telling the story and you heard it before or you think you know it, if you're really not interested, you won't listen. But if you know that that story is going to give you answers to the mysteries of life and the one speaking the story is Jesus then it would have the ability to separate from the listeners to the ones who could care less God even Jesus even preached a parable about the four grounds wayside, stony, thorny and good ground didn't he so those with ears which we should what? hear so we have to be exercised in listening to what the Spirit is saying to the church. 
And we have to be exercised in the word to understand that God's word does, excuse me, God's voice does not contradict his word. No prophecy is given by any private interpretation. It's supposed to line up with the word and benefit those who listen. Can you say amen? So, but basically, there are a lot of people who have ears, but they don't know how to listen to the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit. You, know, you say, well, why, God, why is God so uh, like a dove? Because people who are noisy and boisterous and prideful will push the voice of God away, the dove, the Holy Spirit, away and not know it. So God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Another thing we need to know about God's voice is every perfect and every good gift comes from above. So God's voice. All the batteries. That's okay. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so my mic quit there, and we're gonna speak there and do all these wonderful things. Okay. So the voice of God matches the personality and the character of God. For example, God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. So when God's voice speaks, it won't cause you to doubt. It won't cause you to question unless you're sinning and he tells you to stop it. Stop sinning. Then you'll question. Hello, don't lose me here. But God's voice matches his character and his nature. God's voice also, those of you that are born again, you have God living on the inside of you too. So when God speaks to you, he's not going to speak outwardly through the prince of the air. He'll do that through his word. But he'll speak inwardly in the still small voice, which is in your spirit man. Everyone say spirit man. <clears throat> in our spirit man is where God dwells. That's what it happens. When you get born again, you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and come into your heart. God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit come in to your heart and remove the Adam nature or the sin nature and puts God's nature in there. He doesn't take your spirit out. He takes the Adamic fallen nature of your spirit out and replaces it with his spirit in. And if you can think about Let's, let's use coffee. Uh, I like coffee with cream and sugar. Some people like it black, okay? It doesn't really matter. I can drink it black too. But let's just look at you, okay? You are that coffee, and God is that sugar and that creamer. Once it's applied to the coffee and it's mixed in, it becomes one substance, even though it contains three. Do you follow? And you know, there's some bad teachings about what happens to a person when they get born again. They, they believe that God comes in and shoves your spirit over the side, and he comes in and he has the spirit. I heard that nonsense. No, he comes in and you become one new mixed creature in God. So you become a God type of creature. So which means if you've got God in you, which we do if you're born again, then you have God's voice in there. And God's always talking. But the key is that we're not always listening. In fact, the truth is we're not listening as much as we like to think we are. And I don't mean to put anybody down. It's just the reason why you don't hear his voice clearly every day 
and he's being li he lives in you is because you're preoccupied about other things and the focus is not bright or clear enough of God in the midst of your day. So what do you do, Pastor Kerry? You ask God to switch that within you because you can't do it on your own. You have God switch the eyes of your understanding so all of a sudden it becomes natural to hear God say good morning when you wake up. It's a good day. Hello? While you were asleep and you just woke up, I was awake laying out today. Would you like to hear what's going to happen? And so we need to hear God's voice. It's exciting. So let's go to the scripture where it says it real clear. It's in John chapter 10. We're going to start with verse 1. Now, remember, God speaks in many different ways, but we're listening to his voice. So John 10, verses 1 through 6, uh, New, New King James um, Scripture. Here, let me take a swig of coffee here. I love this mug. All right. Most assuredly, I say to you, Jesus is talking. He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Now, this door is actually two doors. It's a double meaning in this scripture. Who's the door to the sheepfold? Jesus. But what is the door to be born in the earth? Natural birth. So when you read, read this, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter in through natural birth and enter in the sheepfold by the door, natural birth, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and robber. So let me take a minute to explain this, okay? The door enters by the door. How did we get saved? We came through the door through Jesus. Now, we've already painted you a picture of the sheepfold, remember? It looked like a horseshoe. And it had a real fine, it was like a, like a, a horseshoe or a, a round U like that. And the door was just big enough for sheep to go through and for the shepherd to sleep in the door. So the shepherd is the door to the sheep pen. So if the wolves come, the shep they have to go through the shepherd first. Can you say amen? And the only way for the sheep to get out is to go through the door. So you got that one door. The other door is being born in earth through natural birth. Not mean to be a poet, but okay. So Jesus, who is God, who always was God, the word became flesh. So he had to come through natural birth through the door. If anybody tries to be religious without Jesus Christ or would try to set up a religious system without a Messiah, says that they're a thief and robber. If somebody's operating in the earth, without being born here, they would be what? They would be a thief and the robber. Who's the thief and the robber? Was Satan born in the earth? No, he stole the earth from Adam. He even told Jesus, all these things were delivered to me, to my hands. So two doors, you have to be born in order to be to save anybody, you have to come through natural birth. Satan can't save anybody. And God was outside the planet, so he had to find a way to get his son to be born in the planet, yet without sin. So we know the story. Can, can you say amen? Anybody else tries to get saved or be born into this planet through any other means, Satan, mostly including him, He's a thief and a robber. Verse 2. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now you see the first door is described. 
the shepherd of the sheep came through natural birth. Amen? Say amen. To him, the doorkeeper, the Holy Spirit, opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and listen to this next phrase and leads them out. What does Jesus do? He leads us out of darkness into light. He leads us out of starvation into green pastures, into dirty waters, into still waters. He restores my soul. Amen. And the Holy Spirit opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. You see, Jesus leads us. He doesn't drive us. And you can pick up when Satan is a loop or he is amongst us because he's always driving you, forcing you. You know, trying to scare you, trying to hand you fear, telling you you're never going to amount to anything, putting you in that stress mode. And it goes on to say, and then, verse 5, yet they will by no means follow a stranger. So listen, to him the doorkeeper opens, and when he brings his own sheep out, he goes before him, the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And yet they will not follow a stranger, but will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of what? Strangers. Do you know anything about sheep? Of course you do. Sheep, get since they're babies, get used to the shepherd's voice. The shepherd is there day in and day out. He has a special whistle. They know the tone of his voice, just like my birds in my living room. When I walk up, and I walk in and say hi to my wife. The birds start chirping. It's dad. Well, the same with sheep. Okay? They get to know the shepherd's voice. So therefore, if somebody else who's another shepherd of another flock comes, they won't obey that because that's not the sound of the voice they're used to. Everyone say, used to God's voice. Okay, we need to get used to God's voice. That means we have to spend time, quiet time, listening, reading, and don't let any distraction come in till God begins to show you what it sounds like, what it feels like, what it senses like, what are the little witnesses of his voice developing inside of you because he is speaking. It's really not that big of a mystery. But we have been so trained all our life. All of us are young spring chickens. Can you say amen? And we've been sensitized to the world and certain voices, certain sounds. Amen? And so we need to resensitize by spending the time to get to know the shepherd and his voice. We hear all kinds of things speaking to us. And I'm not talking about voices. Let's hope not. But we hear, you know, the world and, and situations and bills and all, all speaking to us. But one still small word from God can still any stress or any problem. So we need really to know God's voice. Can you say amen? All right. So it says, and they will flee from the stranger, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Verse 6 says, and Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Now, we know later on they did. But it's just that way. Have you ever said to your child, do you know what I'm telling you? I know, I know, I know, I know. And you know they don't. We have to be patient. Can you say amen? Well, let's look at a couple of points underneath that. In your notes under John 10 there, you have one through four. The first one, the door here is twofold. Can you tell me what they are? Natural birth and spiritual birth. That's why that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Remember, 
Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. See, some people teach that born of the uh, flesh, of water and the spirit, is water baptism. And it's not water baptism. Because if you're born of the water and you're born of the spirit, you're born out of a sack of water and then to be reborn in the spirit. There you go. So, if you ever crawled out of any water, it was your mom's womb. <laughs> You're not as an amoeba, amoeba, right? Yeah, you look like a one-cell creature. All right, point two. Jesus was the first to be born again. Did you know that? And where was Jesus born again at? You want to take a stab at it? In hell. He came alive in hell. He got born again in hell. He was separated from his father for three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. And then God says, enough. His blood is pure. He's committed no trespasses. And mankind is forgiven. And the spirit of God raised him from the dead. He was born again. That's why he's called the firstborn among many brethren. The first begotten from among the dead. Now you know those phrases. Say, I got it. I got it. Amen. Nobody can beat it out of you. Can you say amen? All right. Thirdly, Jesus tells us his sheep should hear his voice. We should not only hear it, but we should know his voice and turn a deaf ear to falsehoods and false input of strangers. You know what's so neat? She can turn on the news and you can tell false news from good news. True from false. You see, because you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. You can actually, if you let God work in you, you don't have to be nervous or frustrated about anything. You just stand in God. And if somebody's going to lie to you, God's going to expose it. See, that's why we don't take matters into our own hands. Why? Because God's hands are bigger, <laughs> more powerful. That's right. And then fourthly, this tells you and I that we should know God and how he speaks to his children. So if you hear a voice saying, you've done wrong, you better hurry up and repent. Is that God? No. No. People confuse the Old Testament, the way in which God dealt with people, as in the New Testament, it's not the same. You see, in the Old Testament, I'm going to try to explain this. Don't throw me out, but just pay attention. In the Old Testament, we weren't born again. We didn't have God dwelling in us in the Old Testament. I'm going to speak like I was in there, okay? That means God worked with me as long as I paid attention to him. But he wasn't living in me. So when I sin, it was more dangerous to sin then than it is to sin now. And here's what I mean by that. Now listen and be careful. Sin is still sin. How many know sin's evil? Sin's bad. All right. But when you're a child of God, God doesn't look at it as sin that divides you away from him. He looks at it as sin you made a boo-boo, and he will help work you through it. You see the difference? That's why the New Testament is founded on better promises. The earth doesn't open up and suck you down for lying, for complaining. Read 1 Corinthians 10 sometime. They had it pretty rough in the Old Testament. But now that God dwells in you and I, we still can walk carnally, but you and I, when we do wrong, we, we receive the chastisement of the Lord. But God doesn't whack us, break us, snap our legs like some innocent sheep that keeps wandering away. You ever heard that lie? The shepherd breaks the leg of the sheep so he'll never learn to, to wander again. You know, that goes against God's very character and nature. If God snapped my feet... I wouldn't want to serve that kind of God. Hello? Because he's not that way. No, there'll be somebody out there that'll want to argue. So you go ahead and get your feet snapped. 
I've had enough done to mine. But God had nothing to do with it. Can, oh, let's get on past all that. That's just funny stuff. Okay, so listen. How well do we know his voice? So knowing the ways in which God speaks. All right, we've already covered some of this, but we'll do it again. One through five. He speaks first through his word. We call that general um, guidance, general instruction, general guidance. Okay? And then he speaks through his people, through the body of Christ, through apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Thirdly, then through the gifts of the Spirit, revelation gifts, the power gifts, the vocal gifts. Number four, through the still small voice in our spirit. And number five, finally, through circumstances. How many know God can speak through circumstances? That's why I think a lot of people quote that all things work together for good thing. You know, they really don't really look into what it says, but it, God, they're thinking, well, no matter what happens, God will work good out of it. And that's true. Okay, that's true. But the all things God's saying working together for your good is working together for your good against your flesh and against the enemy. What things are working together for my good? The all things pertain to life and godliness when you got born again, God put in your spirit. So the moment your outward man comes in contact with stress and problems, the all things of God and God himself in you starts working on your behalf to get you through it. That's why Romans 8 says, neither death nor life, the things present, the things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love that's in Christ Jesus. Hello? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Why? Because you got the goods inside of you. You've got God Almighty working inside of you. So that while your outward man is getting older, perishing, your inward man is being renewed day by day. So when you read Romans 8 now, you're going to get a little deeper meaning. Yes, God can get good out of any accident or mistake. You know, got people saved through the Twin Towers. You know, all kinds of crazy things. But God didn't do the Twin Towers so that people would repent. Do you understand? That's a lie from the pit of hell. Okay? Rotten things are in the world. But all the good and all the perfect stuff besides in heaven dwells in your spirit. Scripture does say, and this is a mind blower, says if God's in your spirit, can God sin? So if you let God in your spirit guide your life, it's going to minimize your sin. Woo! Amen. The trouble is, if you're blowing it all the time, you're not letting God run your life. Okay, let's move right off of that real quick. So, so God finally uses circumstances, especially when we don't listen to his still small voice. This is God's last resort. See, I told you, you fell off the cliff, you're home early, but I told you not to get up and go out there. Hello. So you can't say, son, you're dead and here early because I made you fall off the cliff. No, I had a friend one time, really sweet brother, had a lovely three, three boys and a wife. And God told him, don't climb that tree and don't trim that tree. Told him three times. Instead, he got all full of himself, climbed up there, says, I can do it. And his strap got caught, and the tree bent over like this and flung him up in the air and down on his neck and killed him instantly. Now, all things work together pretty good. No, there wasn't anything good in that. But God worked and straightened all the mess out caused by somebody not listening. So there is stuff like that. Look at Ananias and Sapphira in the fifth book of Acts. 
So we do need to hear God's voice. We need to know God's will for our life because this planet is dangerous. It's full of an evil spirit, spirits of infirmity and all that. I don't want to sound negative. You and I are actually walking in a cesspool. It's beautiful cesspool, but a cesspool because it's full of the devil and full of these things. So we need the help of the Holy Spirit. We need to understand the word, and we need to be able to hear God's voice in us and let him order our steps. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, discerning who might be talking to us. That's my first point. We should not be ignorant about what the enemy or how the enemy works. Say amen, somebody. Amen. And what do you mean by that? Don't blame God for things he didn't do. We should have a clear understanding of who God is and what his character is like and the nature of his very being. And we have that in our born-again spirit. We need to match that up with the way he communicates to us. If you hear a voice saying, I'm going to judge you in your life, Repent. That's not even New Testament. Here's another one. I'm going to blow your minds. Judgment is going to come down upon America. Really? Who, which part? Which town? Silly person. Judgment comes down on anybody that doesn't accept Jesus. Doesn't matter what nation they're in. And you know what? To a born-again believer, we are already judged and found innocent through Jesus' blood. So guess what? Stand up and go, let judgment fall. Because I've been judged already and found innocent. And even if you're making mistakes in the New Testament, don't let the devil lie to you. God's not going to drop judgment down here and rattle your teeth. He's going to say, let me help you up. As long as you're in that body, you're going to constantly make, make mistakes. So walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, Paul said. I don't preach myself happy now. Now listen, it's very, it's, we're, you guys are set up. Wait till you hear Sunday's sermon. I got some stuff from God to blow our minds. Not because I am anything special. I just love to go after God and have God show me what the word says. You know, I want God to teach me too. Can you say amen? So you can have all of that. I mean, just go after it. How serious are you? Okay, remember, match everything up with what lines up with the word of God, especially the way it communicates. John 10, 5 again says, yet they will by no means follow a stranger. Hello? What'd your parents tell? Stranger danger? <laughs> Amen. But we'll flee from him, for they do not know the voice of what? Folks, how can, how can uh, you discern God's voice? How can you line it up with scripture? So God's voice, first of all, won't have anything evil in it, will it? It won't have any darkness. Here's another one that everybody, when God gives you a dream, you'll wake up with the interpretation. Not be wondering what it means. You're in the New Testament, not the old. The old, they, God gave an impression and they were to chase the impression so he could give them the meaning. In the New Testament, you have God dwelling on the inside of you. The meaning is in you. What's that mean? How does it apply to my life? Well, that's what we should be doing with the word. What's the word going to say to me today in the sermon? What is it going to reveal to me today? I'm expecting God to speak to me. Are you that way when it comes to hearing his voice? I'm expecting God to talk to me out of his word. How often do you read the Bible a day? I'm hungry, Lord, for you to speak to me. Open the Bible first. Let him speak to you through the pages. 
and get out of the Old Testament and into the New. And let him talk to you, especially other than do in the revelation of God dwelling in you and you in dwelling God. Now listen to this. John 10.10 10 says this. The thief does not come except to steal, to take away truth from you, to kill, to kill all livelihood, and literally destroy lives, and to destroy. Jesus said, I have come that they, those that hear my voice, may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. See, you have to hear his voice to accept the Lord. Hello? Because remember, when you first accepted Jesus, you actually, you might not have heard, go up to the altar. No, you, you just felt an impression of God tugging on your heart. That was his voice. See, God can use tugging on your heart as an expression of communication. Hello? But the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. How did God say? Him that has, more shall be what? Given. And to him, it shall be given more. So the one that has, more shall be given, and they will have an abundance. But him that thinks he has, but does not, even what they think they have will be taken away. Who's the thief in the Bible? Satan. Satan. So if you think you have something, but it's not given by revelation... It's just kind of something you figure is yours. Satan's going to work to steal it. Every bit of truth, every bit of things that God give you are in his hands. And Satan can't take those things. That's why you get a new car dedicated to God. Get a new house dedicated to God. And like that guy down the street, wherever he is, you got a new wife, come to church. I have married me a wife, and I cannot come to church. Do you know Jesus said that? Uh -huh. Well, I'm meddling, so let's get on past this, okay? Look what James says. James chapter 1, 16 through 18, relating to hearing God's voice. It says, do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good gift, what kind of gift? Good. Every perfect gift, what kind of gift? is from above and comes down from the father of lights in whom there is no changeable or variableness or shadow of turning. In other words, God doesn't give something to you. says, no, I changed my mind. Take it away from you. So once you've given you a gift, whether you use it or not, it's up to you. But when you stand before him and he says, I gave you this gift, you did He's not going to yank it from you. It's kind of like your arm. You break your arm, they tie it off for six months. Then when you, you still have muscles, you still have your arm. But now you have to learn its tone again. Well, your ears have tone. The exercising of listening to the word, listening to God, will get you set up to hear God's still small voice. Amen. Of his own will. Now listen to this. I love this scripture. It's got a lot of meat in it. Listen. Of his own will. See, you are the will of God. He wants you. He brought us forth. How did he bring us forth, Pastor Gary? By the word of truth. If you're never in the Bible, he can't bring the real you out. He only brings out what you understand to be the truth out. And what people understand to be the truth might not be exactly what the truth really is. Yes. Remember the man that was given the talent and he thought God was somebody else than who God really was. He thought he was unfair. He thought he did things. And so he better hide God's money lest he lose any of it. Many Christians today are busy hiding and busy compromising and God says, you need to hear my voice and hear my marching orders because I said pr to you, pray that you be counted worthy to escape those things that are coming on the earth. Blessed are those that are praying and watching. 
when I come. So that's us. Can you say amen? amen. All right, so look what James, he says, look it. He says, by his own word brought us forth that we might be the kind of first fruits of his creation. A couple of points underneath that, one through six. God is not the author of confusion. Everyone say amen. When he speaks, he makes it clear in the New Testament. Two, God puts his fingerprint on all that he says, all that he does. What do you mean? When he speaks, it exhorts, beckons us to improve. When he speaks, it comforts. He says, now you make this change and man, you're going to prosper. I'm going to, I guarantee it. And it, it edifies. So God's fingerprint, if it's a word from a pulpit, a word from a prophet or prophecy, if it's a vision, if it's a word from whoever, it will have God's fingerprint on it and Satan cannot duplicate that fingerprint. You see, God has things that Satan can't duplicate. So you see, he tries to make a $3 bill when God has the right payments. Can you say amen? amen. He mimics God without substance. And the thing I'm trying to say is that with, with understanding how God works, okay, he speaks, he makes it clear, and he puts his fingerprint on it. So if God tells you, if somebody gives you a word, if I give you a word, I'll say the Lord, it should exhort you to become better or challenged to do something more. It should comfort because you know that through God's corrections and exhortations, it brings a peaceable fruit of righteousness. And it should edify. Edify means to charge up or build up. So every word given to you will exhort, comfort, and build you up. And if it doesn't, you can shelve it. Hello. I say, oh, thus saith the Lord, you've been a bad girl. You've been a bad boy. Sell your dog and give me your car. Yeah, 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 yeah. Enough of that nonsense. <laughs> All right, so let's move on past this. Okay, 1 Corinthians 12, listen to 1 through 3. Gives us some wisdom about the voice of God and knowing it. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, he says in verse 1, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. That means lack knowledge. You know that you were Gentiles. You weren't Jewish, so all the rest are Gentiles carried away with these dumb idols. A dumb idol is an idol that can't speak. However, you were, however, you were led. Remember, Gentiles through the wilderness and through, through the promised land. It says, don't mingle, don't mix with them. They had all these weird things, remember? Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus anathema. Curse it. So if the Spirit of God is speaking, it won't bring any question to God or about God, and it won't bring anything that plays down God's work. Hello? Just won't. If it does, it's somebody mimicking God in the flesh. And we won't stay there very long because I'm not teaching on the gifts. But catch this, okay? Okay? All right. No one who prophesies calls Jesus a curse, and no one can say Jesus is Lord. The better translation is Jesus is my Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Everyone say Jesus is my Lord. Now, a person who has the wrong spirit can't say that. They can say Jesus is Lord, but they can't say Jesus is my Lord. Because if they have a spirit, that spirit won't confess the lordship of Jesus. It can't. So if you get a little angel shows up in your living room 
and it says, I come to you in the name of the Lord. You say, do you love Jesus? Is Jesus, you said Jesus, was your, do you love Jesus? And immediately, as soon as you challenge it, if it's of God, be no problem. If it isn't, poof. Always challenge everything that comes your way. Line it up with scripture. Put the eyeglasses of Jesus on. And if it doesn't line up with Jesus, then don't receive it. Say amen. See, Jesus is our New Testament eyeglasses. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? There are certain truths that are out there, sound real good, but they don't line up to Jesus. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Well, you just got through reading where God does not take away what he gives you. What he gives you. Now, you could take loosely that scripture and say the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. You could loosely say the Lord gives you eternal life and takes away your sin. But see, that quote comes from the Old Testament. <laughs> so, it was Job's misunderstanding that God can be mean sometimes and you better straighten up. I'm going to tell you, God's never unjust about anything. Never unfair, never bearing, except for against sin and the evil one. All right, moving right on. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 14, 3 says, concerning knowing his voice, but he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort. Say amen. All right, hearing and knowing God's voice. Mark 4, please. Verse 21 through 26. And he said to them, is the lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? What's the answer, everybody? No. Is it not to be set on a lampstand? What's the answer? Yes. For there is nothing hidden which shall not be what? Revealed. Nor has anything been kept secret. That's, we're seeing that now. All over the airwaves. But that I should, that it should not come to the light. If anyone has ears to hear, there we go. Let them what? Hear. So you can have ears, but they don't have to hear. You have to really pay attention. So that shows purpose, effort. Verse 24 says, Then he said to them, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure that you use or listen, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. What's he saying there? He says, if you've got a pair of ears and you're not using them for God, be careful the thief doesn't take away your hearing. And I'm not referring to necessarily having you know, hearing aids. I'm just saying your sensitivity to recognize if God is warning you, trying to instruct you, trying to get your attention because you're dull of hearing. And a person gets dull of hearing when they walk carnally in the flesh for any length of time. If you find yourself dipping down in the flesh, get out quickly. You fall into a mud puddle, stand up. Oh, but us adults, we have to tell everybody how we feel, make everybody else jump in the same bad feeling mode. You know what I mean. So in order to do that, we have to be sensitive to his word. How much word do you actually read a day? You need to read some to get used to that sensation and, and that feel of the word speaking to you. It's like a meal. You need to eat it. You need to drink it. So, all right. Then he said to them, take heed what you hear and how you listen. A couple of points. The lamp is your reborn again human spirit. It's made to project. It has the ability in it 
to pick up on things from God. Two, after all, God indwells us. Let him bear witness to what truth you hear. Literally, somebody's talking to you and the truth-bearing spirit's in you. If they say something you, you need to hear, you'll have a witness. Doesn't matter if they're talking football or spaceships. If there's something their Holy Spirit needs you to hear, a truth, he'll bear witness with it. That's why you bring your witness bearer to church and leave your flesh and your brains in the car. Please. Especially if we have cameras and people find you sleeping. Bummer, bummer, bummer. Because we're moving them on you now. We're watching every sleep. No. Anyway, so it's important that we, we listen, isn't it? Amen. So I got a chance to meddle a little bit there. So let's go on. So at two, after all, God indwells us, right? We'll bear with us. Three, spending time with God sensitizes us, saturates us with his presence. We get to know and get to sense that presence even before it has a chance really to build. You and I will know what's on God's mind if we spend that time with him. Amen? All right, Romans 8, listen to this, 14 through 16. Whereas many as are led by the Spirit, these are the sons or adult sons of God. It's the Greek word, weos, okay? For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, talking about your flesh, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Father, you are far away, but now you're my dad. Daddy, Father. And I know it sounds real kind of lame, but you're, he's your dad. He's your loving father and your authoritative father. Tells you how far you can go and loves you right on back in. Remember the prodigal son should be called the loving father instead of that. Okay. And the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Say, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of light, not of darkness. The wrath of God abides on the children of disobedience. Say it, the wrath of God abides on the children of disobedience, but I'm a child of the king. Everything I quoted was scripture. Oh, we're not too familiar with the, you know, children of disobedience. Read Ephesians 2. <coughs> All right. A couple of points and we'll be done. Point one, God is truth, right? Who dwells in you? The truth-bearing spirit who's leading us outside of us. The truth-bearing spirit who's guiding our steps. The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're those people that delight ourselves in God. Yes. And then he'll bring it to pass. Yes. Wow. That's who you are. Amen. Now, there is clarity and simplicity in what God always tells his kids. Everyone say clear and simple. Say it again, clear and simple. Why do you suppose God speaks to us clearly and simply? Because so we can get it, my wife says, and that's the truth. We don't need things complicated. We just need them clear and simple. If you read Proverbs chapter 1, it says, Wisdom cries out and says, how long are you simple ones going to ignore what I'm saying to you? And if you continue to do it, when calamity comes, I'm going to laugh at you. But those that listen to me and pay attention to what I say will dwell safely and be quiet from any fear of evil. Proverbs 133. All right. So John 2, 20 and 21 tells us that we have the anointing inside of us and we know all things. So, like, like Joe brought up a couple of weeks ago, 
Now, when the word's going forth and you sense the, the spirit of God moving in you, those, that's the spirit of God pulling from what is spoken or read into you for you to pay attention to it and dwell on it so we can teach you about it. Say amen. Because we don't know everything, do we? So verse 24 through 27 and, and finishing. Therefore let that abide in you which also you've heard from the beginning. And if you have heard from the beginning that which abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. He's talking about the gospel. And this is the promise that he's promised. He promised us eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. You don't need all these others to teach you. But the same anointing inside of you will teach you all things concerning the truth. And that which is not a lie, in other words, will point out a lie, point out what's the truth. Just as I have taught you, you will abide in him. So funny thing is you've got the Holy Spirit outside of you guiding your steps, revealing truth. You've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, revealing God, helping you guide your steps, right? What does the devil have? He's hoping he has enough of your attention. He still can confuse us. He can distract us. He can talk us out of coming to church. For whatever good reason, oh, you got to help something. You got to go over here and help somebody here. And so you miss the word of God, which is the only thing that God uses to change us into the image of his son. Well, if you got something out of that tonight, let's praise the Lord, huh?